Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Wait, no, I'm, I'm testing out the mic. Everyone hear me? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to, pardon me, I'm going to fix this. Good morning, everyone. This is Donna Prosser with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We are, we are ready, ready to, to get, get started, started now. All right, well, we are very excited today to welcome several uh, panelists. And, um, and I, am, I am gonna pause for one moment just to make sure that all of our panelists are unmuted and ready to go. So bear with us just a moment. All right, well, it looks like we're still waiting for a few of our panelists to join. So um, we're probably gonna just have everybody introduce themselves as they come on the line. But I, I do believe that Mike Durkin is with us. Mike, are you here? Yeah, uh, hi Donna, and uh, good afternoon from, from the UK to everybody, and good morning to you all from, from the Pacific coast, but uh, I'm sure different time zones across the whole of the webinar group. Yeah, Thank you. exactly, exactly. Well, thanks for joining, Mike. And and as I said, our other panelists will be joining um, as we as we move on here. 
So welcome to our, our, our fourth webinar about the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the fourth, the third week of the pandemic. And you can see that it is, this uh, map has definitely changed since our first week of doing this webinar. So we won't go into detail about this, but again, we've left the link here for you. So when we send out the PowerPoint presentations, you should have all of this information available to you. Um, and so we were hoping that Ed Kelly would be able to join us for the international perspective. I believe he's going to be able to join us at about uh, about 8.30 Pacific Standard Time today. So um, we're going to come back um, to that. And we are, we're, we're also hoping to be joined by the Centers for Disease Control today to give us an American perspective of what's happening here. Um, but moving on, we would like to talk a little bit about what's happening on the front line. We we're really very happy that uh, today we were able to speak with Sarah L. Bellino and Giulia Dalliana from um, Tuscany, Italy. They are on the front lines there working for the, the World Health Organization Collaborating Center. And um, I was able to speak with them and, and do a little bit of a Zoom interview this morning because they couldn't be with us for the actual webinar. So I'm going to show you uh, some, just a few little snippets of what they had to say. Thank you very much. The, the director of the Patient Safety Center here in the Tuscany region, coordinating uh, all the public and private hospitals for uh, quality and safety activities. And uh, I'm also coordinator of the WHO Collaborating Center together with Julia Dagliana that is here uh, with me today. And my background is in social sciences and I have a PhD in high reliability organization. Thank you also from my side for uh, this, in, this invitation. Uh, okay, my name is Julia. I have been working at the Center for Clinical Risk Management and Patient Safety of the Tuscany region since 2011 uh, in the position of quality and safety uh, manager. And along with Sarah, I am uh, uh, the coordinator of the WHO Collaborating Center. You know, one of the, the big problems is uh, the lack of uh, intensive care beds in order to, um, to receive all uh, the sick patients. Here in Italy, we have uh, around 5,000 um, ICU beds, uh, considering both public and private hospitals, and this number is not uh, sufficient uh, for all the patients, the sick patients that uh, need the respiratory assistance for for, for COVID-19. Uh, for COVID-19, so uh, one of the most critical aspects is related to the reorganization of the hospitals in order to reconvert uh, beds. Um, from the, 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 the worlds to, to be beds for the, for the ICUs. And uh, in order to do so, it's very important to have a, um, a regional and also national coordination uh, among the hospitals. Uh, there were some uh, specific specific solutions that were implemented, uh, like the creation of pre-triage areas. We have uh, in each hospital, uh, before the emergency room, uh, an area outside the hospital where all the the patients can do a pre-triage. Then the other solution that worked was to create some operational uh, centers at the regional and national level to coordinate the, um, the counting of the ICU beds and also the conversion uh, and the check uh, of the availability of the ICU beds in the different uh, hospitals. And also we reconverted some uh, hotels uh, and bed and breakfast, you know, this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of services to uh, accept patients uh, who are not critical anymore, so they're not, uh, they don't need the, the ICU anymore, but they need to stay, the recover time is very long. Uh, and so you need a place where uh, uh, people can be, uh, patients can be isolated from their family because uh, 
they, they, they can be still contagious, but also um, where you don't need uh, a lot of uh, assistance from uh, physicians and nurses. Uh, there is uh, the possibility for healthcare workers uh, to use uh, hotels or as Sarah said, all the, infra the, the, the infrastructure that generally I use to welcome tourists that are converted also to uh, welcome healthcare workers that are working in COVID uh, units and that don't feel safe in going back home. Um, and also to prevent uh, the spread of the virus within families. Then I will say some, some words regarding the importance of uh, starting from uh, the very beginning of the, um, of the spread of the virus, uh, the uh, measure for social distancing, uh, because uh, we know also from the we knew also from the experience in, uh, in China uh, that uh, these measures are more um, effective if they are implemented very, very soon. And as is very well known, the protective equipment um, has been a very important uh, issue here. Uh, we, uh, we had a problem in the management, in the stock line, uh, also because uh, um, several people uh, use the protective equipment in uh, an improper way. Uh, we had 90% of the, the total number of people infected were uh, clinicians. And uh, this is uh, more than double, double comparing to the Chinese uh, uh, clinicians who got infected. One of the most critical issues is uh, communication, especially uh, communication to the uh, to the sharp end. It is very difficult to uh, inform all the clinicians. Uh, you need very simple tools that can be used into the hospitals at the sharp end to describe what to do and when to do it. And also it is important to start producing PPEs like uh, like masks locally. And also consider a very important uh, training and simulation of the procedures to be done before this kind of emergency can happen. Thank you very much for this. All right. Well, Mike, um, if you could take us through a little bit of the lessons learned there and, and, uh, and, and kind of do a little debrief with us on that, would you? Okay, thank, thank you, Donna. Um, so, uh, without recapping everything they, they, they talked about, Sarah and Julia, it's quite clear uh, that there are a number of aspects that dealing on the clinical side, but also on the organizational side for us to learn. The first and key one, which is echoed constantly from colleagues across uh, the world, is, is act early. So, early triage is really important, uh, and early triage outside of the hospital. So if you can create an environment uh, outside of the acute center where you can do uh, early triage, uh, symptom management and control, uh, and then decision making with regard to whether or not those patients will proceed through. Um, that's with or without testing, I think, at the moment in many places. So early triage is key. The second point, I think, in terms of the clinical aspects is regional and national coordination of activities um, so that systems, so that mutual aid systems can be put in place right from the beginning uh, rather than uh, a, a challenge that is often presenting itself now across the world uh, in trying to then create uh, mutual aid systems and create regional and, and national coordination mechanisms. I think a third one on the organization of care is the development of centers for COVID. So recognizing that this is a specific area and where it is possible to create centers of excellence for, for COVID uh, at a district or regional level, if that's possible. And then within hospitals to developing into a, a COVID and a non-COVID system uh, or within the healthcare facilities that are available, a COVID and a non-COVID system. And then becoming increasingly important is the uh, is the conversion of, of other facilities to support patients uh, who are not critical, 
uh, who are either on a path, uh, pre-critical path, or are actually a post-critical path, whether for recovery, so conversion of other other centres near near to uh, the healthcare facility, and in their case, they've used a lot of hotels, and we, uh, that's a similar model uh, around uh, other parts. I think the other piece was the the behavioural aspects and the important elements uh, for healthcare workers in particular, but also for others. So. Support for healthcare workers, both in terms of creating uh, separate housing for them, uh, because often shifts will will be extended, uh, and pay, and healthcare workers may or may not want to go home. They probably shouldn't be going home. And so, have we got facilities to support our healthcare workers during this phase? Uh, the social distancing uh, is absolutely key amongst us, uh, both within our, our work and, and across the health of the healthcare system. So early implementation of that and maintain maintenance of that is absolutely key to interrupt the chain of the viral uh, spread chain. Uh, communication campaign. So communication, not just uh, across the piece uh, for our, our uh, public, uh, which is a key element to it, but also communication chains and and, and uh, amongst us as health professionals uh, to help support us, to help m m create new rules to follow. Uh, and as you heard from, from Julia, I think it was saying, really make things simple. Uh, policies are inevitably complicated and we need to make things simple. We need to have simple algorithms uh, and simple uh, uh, approaches. Uh, and, you, and the use of social media uh, here is, has been very useful. PPP is an issue everywhere. Uh, it's an issue both in terms of the supply chain uh, and how we how we create and create and, uh, and use facilities we've already got, but also the training uh, in the use of PPE is absolutely critical for who, where, and when. So national guidelines uh, are, are great, but they need to be reinterpreted at a local level and put in place simply. So simple, simple guidelines. Supply chain. Uh, may or may not now start to use local manufacturers for doing different elements of the supply chain and creating different aspects and different pieces of equipment that are, are required. Another piece that, that, that came through earlier was a dedicated phone number for lo local phone number, a dedicated phone number uh, for access to, the, to, uh, to uh, the healthcare facility. And I think more and more the, the, the realization that this is developing a, the new reality uh, of, of how we will be working. This is not going to be over uh, in a number of, of, of weeks. This is going to be continuing for a, a long time. So there is also a more of a strategic context, uh, a need for really seamless cooperation between and within systems, particularly where there are multiple different systems working across a nation. Uh, healthcare workers need to be put in the first place for support, for provisions, for shopping, uh, the ch their children need to be supported and looked after, and we need to be able to have preferential access uh, to PPE training uh, uh, and the use of and the facilities of PPE for all healthcare workers. At a national level, there needs to be national and international planning uh, between countries. We cannot survive on our own without the mutual aid between us all. And I think probably more and more as 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 we see the impact uh, in uh, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, and now emerging in Italy, the realization that the exit is not easy. The exit needs to be coordinated and it will be difficult. Uh, and we need to be vigilant uh, in terms of the second and third phase of recovery. Um, I think that's probably enough uh, from me uh, at the moment, but happy to, to, to talk later, answer questions. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Thank you, Mike, that was great. Yes, it was, it's, and I really appreciate you setting up the, those um, interviews with us this morning. Um, it is, it's crucial to be able to hear from what's happening um, in, in Italy and Spain, South Korea and, and China. And especially as, as we get into the, the second phase of this where we're beginning to come to a new normal. So we're, we're looking forward to hearing more from Sarah and Julia about what's happening there. We wanted to bring your attention to our actionable patient safety solutions, our, our apps here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Just to remind you, when as, as our capacity in our hospitals increases, the safety of all of the patients in the entire organization is at, at higher risk. And so we've created uh, links here for all of the apps that 
we know you may be interested in. And so, um, so you'll have access to that when we send this out. Excellent. Okay. So uh, is Robin Betts with us yet? Oh, yes. I'm with you. Thank you. Oh, hi, Robin. Hi. Hi. Um, if you could, uh, before you get started, uh, just introduce yourself for the folks who haven't heard from you yet. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm Robin Betts, uh, Vice President of uh, Quality, uh, Clinical Effectiveness, and Regulatory Services. I also have Risk Management and Patient Safety and and infection prevention uh, for Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. Uh, we're in one of the nation's hot spots and um, currently have, we're managing about 150 po COVID positive patients in our hospitals with about that same amount that are under investigation right now. Those are admitted patients in the hospital. And then we have many of our patients that are um, uh, that have been tested but being managed uh, at home. Um, and I'm also on the board of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and have been for uh, really since the second year um, of their existence. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm kind of bringing forward the perspective of um, the challenges of the healthcare uh, delivery system, um, the hospitals particularly. So um, here in Northern California, I have 21 hospitals and I would say um, PPE is probably um, the, the biggest challenge. Uh, we actually have been able to continually procure um, enough PPE for to provide the care and to follow the CDC and World Health Organization guidelines. The challenge is that um, there's a lot of societal fear and our labor unions and our nurses don't feel that it's enough. So it's trying to balance um, being a good steward um, with these recommended um, uh, isolation precautions and at the same time provide what, what, our, um, what our staff need. So if you wanna just go to the next slide, in working with many um, healthcare systems, um, they've kind of put in place a, a little more flexibility for the staff. So up at the top is here's the clinical use of like masks. So here's what we expect um, you to use. You use our equipment that is medical grade and tested and um, evaluated and approved by our infection prevention program. But at the bottom, really easing up and allowing flexibility if people want to wear some sort of a physical barrier mask throughout the day, just because uh, it, it uh, establishes confidence uh, uh, in the environment that we're, that, you know, we flex a little bit. So there's, you know, so people are wearing cloth masks or things that they brought from home that may be um, equally as good, but they just haven't been assessed and approved by our organization. Um, so this is just an example of how we're responding and how organizations are responding to um, the needs of labor for their confidence and security. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, in anticipation for possibly um, running short, we are, um, organizations are getting creative. Um, this is an organization where uh, partnered with the Carpenters Union to keep them employed, and they've developed um, face guards, um, kind of physical barrier guards, one disposable model and three reusable industrial grade models. And um, the, the, um, the disposable model, actually um, the organization are able to produce, produce 1,300 a day with, 30, uh, with, with just 30 staff. And uh, the components of it are there on the bottom of how you do that. So they're doing this assembly line um, fashion. And then uh, because they're produced every day at this rate, um, they're able to give uh, two to each, each uh, employee every day and they can wear them throughout the day and have a disposable face shield. Uh, you know, that may, again, gives them more confidence in their work environment. We, they are being asked to put on the appropriate PPE when um, a, that matches the isolation protocol for the organization. But again, um, this is something people are doing. And you know, if in the end the supply chain does run out, uh, 
this will provide something over nothing. Um, so anyway, it's been really fun to see the market respond. Uh, but again, um, here in America, um, the federal government may push uh, the development supplies much like we saw in World War II. So um, we do see um, actions around that. Um, do you want to go to the next slide? Um, Stanford University, this was just something that uh, popped up. Uh, they've actually um, found ways to, to um, heat and uh, disinfect um, N95 masks through heat and publish their, their study. That link there, just for organizations who are curious, I went to the link and it's all the work that uh, the Stanford Engineering Department is doing around PPE and all of their current studies on um, how they can treat it in different ways to make it reusable. So that might be helpful um, as, again, your supply chain is running low and you wanna look at what's been done and what has been the scientific outcomes that really very um, open network to uh, a lot of work being done in the back. I was very impressed that they were so transparent about what they were doing. So this was just really informational, not that we're endorsing it in any way, but, but just know that there is some evidence of work that's been done and so testing has been done and you can at least see the results. And there's lots of um, others using like UV light, what was their findings with that and things like that. So uh, that's in there as just a link of another scientific reference um, for extending the use of PPE. Um, so I wanna go to the next slide. I would say that um, another big focus is um, increasing your bed capacity, um, really looking at strategies to expand uh, your capability twofold in the hospital and threefold for critical care. That's been um, kind of our targets here, just by reducing elective surgeries uh, and other elective procedures, as well as kind of fear of the public who often come and use our emergency rooms unnecessarily. We've been able to decant our hospitals by about 40 to 45 percent. It's not quite 50 percent, but um, those things alone um, have, have helped a lot. Um, but here lists um, some of the things that you can do uh, as you think about surge that you really start with prioritize and maintain your ICU patients within the hospital when, when possible. Utilize all your existing ICU beds um, and then move to trauma, cardiovascular, neuro, pediatric um, for patients up to 21 years, of course, for, for the pediatric. Um, and then maximize your out of ICU um, those for step down areas. So um, some of the things that we've done is uh, looked at our PACUs and, and uh, pre-op care areas and really set them up with the equipment, the supplies and the beds to convert them into extensions of our ICU. Um, and, then, um, and then once those are maximized, but of course before you need them, um, expand your capability into alternative spaces. Um, and there's some examples there. While uh, we, we get focused on the expansion of our capability and that's all well and good, uh, we also have to think about how do we staff uh, those. And so um, really focusing on making sure that we do have the competency uh, within um, those that come into this space who are not necessarily uh, there all the time, but highly capable. Our PACURNs are used to managing um, ventilators and, and high acuity post-op patients. So um, we, we have uh, created a skills assessment and kind of an individualized um, just-in-time uh, core education plan uh, for those that join our teams in the critical care space. And then we pair them. Uh, we, our staffing model would be to have kind of a, a tiered staffing where you have a very experienced ICU RN partnered with maybe a PACU uh, RN so that they can work as a team. And the, the, the person who doesn't necessarily always work there but has definitely knowledge and, and a high level of skills um, has someone that they can turn to for questions and answers. And, um, <clears throat> and really 
doing your best to maintain appropriate staffing ratios. Some of the things that our governments are doing all around the world are really relaxing licensing um, restrictions. So um, in, in Europe, they're um, offering returners, those who have left uh, clinical care and retirement to come back and, and uh, loosen up, uh, probably based on some sort of time frame, allow them to return and uh, move back into the workforce. Um, uh, in the, the United States, we have cross-state boundaries. Uh, we, you generally are licensed to a state, but they're honoring the licenses across states and so easing the way to bring in other providers from uh, other areas as you see surges across the country. Um, around the world, we're seeing the use of senior medical and nursing students and interns and residents and, and um, allowing them to practice more autonomously as uh, these patients surge on our society. And then really looking at more volunteers to support non-clinical activities. But I mean, I think the thing that's really important is to not do this willy-nilly, but have a plan in advance. And so that takes me to the next slide. Um, and this is just an example of a staffing model that it was published by the uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine. That link is actually takes you to their playbook as well as the critical care that the Ontario Health Plan critical care playbook during a pandemic. Uh, I will say this, this model here was referenced in both of these playbooks, but it really um, gives you a, a framework to begin to um, strategize on how you'll build your rapid expansion of your medical facility your, um, to support your existing inpatient and critical care capacity. And they use a framework of space. How do you plan your space? Stuff, what's the equipment supplies that you need to make sure are there in your space? And what does it look like? What are the carts you put together? Those kinds of things. And then staff, what's your strategy for staff? And then they give you ideas around that. So, you know, you're not alone. Um, this has been forged before us. And so really look to, um, resources like this so you're not reinventing the wheel. And again, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation will uh, make these slides available um, to all of us uh, after, after this. Um, I think, do you want to go to the next slide? Um, I was asked, like, what are the real-time quality issues? What, what are we seeing uh, as unique challenges uh, in this COVID environment for our quality staff and our quality oversight? And what we have seen is some drift to, um, from prior performance on um, various hospital acquired condition and in infections. So we've seen a little bit of elevation in, in C. diff um, and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and our CAUTIs. Mostly, I, I think really the story here is um, it's seeing drift from um, a couple things. When we have uh, different providers coming into our spaces, there, when you look at the, the, the um, HAI apps for, from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, the actual patient safety solutions, um, they have one on my, um, antimicrobial stewardship. And so sometimes when uh, people are unfamiliar with um, the workflows, they do over testing and then over treating. And so really uh, making sure that we have tight um, uh, practice around the standard work that we know prevents hospital acquired conditions and infections. But our greatest challenge has been um, a little emergence and it hasn't been like excessive, but we've just seen a small increase in our hospital acquired pressure industry, it, it, sorry, injuries. For those that are non-clinical, this would be um, what used to be called a bed sore, but they're not necessarily the bed sores that you're thinking of like on the coccyx. These are really um, device uh, pressure ulcers like on the face or other parts of the body for these patients that are on special beds because they are on uh, they are so sick that they need to be turned prone uh, to help with their ventilation and so they're on these uh, roto prone beds that allow us to make patients prone uh, without having to flip them um, and and also these patients that have acute respiratory distress syndrome they also have um, displacement of fluids, so they're very, um, they get very edematous, which makes them vulnerable. So 
Um, there's two wonderful references on how to manage these patients that don't tolerate repositioning well. And especially if you uh, are fortunate to have a rotoprone bed, um, it, it really, those rotoprone beds uh, um, set up a unique opportunity to develop um, different types of pressure ulcers, but also help us manage these patients uh, very well. But these two links below, um, uh, the one from uh, Northwell and the other one are wonderful um, helps on how to manage uh, and reduce pressure ulcers um, on these types of patients. So I highly recommend that they use the framework of um, choose, cushion, inspect, avoid, educate, be aware, and confirm. I would say Northwell's resource is probably the most succinct and the easiest to share with your teams. Um, then there was this question to me about how can we manage these? And I think proactive monitoring of your quality and clinical staff uh, we're using to be just beef up our observations and our support to clinical staff and education and 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 even ob observing PPE to make sure people don't self inoculate as they put take off their PPE. Um, we are using some of our sur surgery nurses who are really great uh, with PPE and infection prevention to enhance and support our um, infection prevention teams who are really managing on the outbreak surveillance and, and outreach to uh, possible exposures and things like that. It's a very tedious work when you have an insurgence like this. And then really building in, uh, for those of you sense, uh, who understand the science of high reliability, greater sensitivity to operations. So use your unit champions um, to really um, own uh, the work and performance of their, their teams. Uh, huddle boards and, and reminders so that as, as your teams huddle together daily that you are reminding them, you know what your current performance is and reminding them of those um, activities that reduce. Use your visual management um, to track so that your team knows exactly where they're at with both um, process measures and outcome measures um, so that you create that kind of collective mindfulness around safety. And then sharing, I think sharing stories. You know, hey team, yesterday we found a pressure, uh, a pressure ulcer on Mr. So-and-so and, -so, and uh, it was because we didn't use the, the, um, the cushion tape uh, on the face on that prone bed. So let's really make sure we're using all of our uh, preventive measures uh, today and we're gonna be doing rounding and inspecting all of our patients on rotoprone beds. So just something like that where just every day there's this engagement in safety and quality. Um, so those are the things that my organization are doing and, um, and really um, welcome to share with you as well. I think that uh, that's it. So I'll turn it back over to Donna, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. Well, um, we are very excited now to be joined by Ed Kelly from the World Health Organization. Ed, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you great. Thank you so very much for joining us today. I know that you are a very, very busy man. Well, you're very kind, and I'm sorry that I was only able to, to join for 30 minutes here. I was writing um, a whole bunch of notes down uh, to um, just as your, uh, some of your other panelists were talking, so it's very, help, very helpful for us, too. Great, excellent. Well, yeah. Well, Ed, if you could, would you share just a little bit about the international perspective? What are you seeing um, at the World Health Organization in terms of what's been working and what's not working? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, quickly just to compliment some of the very, very useful uh, discussions that are happening on this uh, webinar uh, on a regular basis. And I'm sorry that I wasn't able to join last week, but certainly hope that we can be here on a weekly uh, basis with you all um, is a, a couple of things. So first, just some, some global perspective and then some thoughts about specifically for the US. Um, you know, we now have 193 countries, uh, states and territories that are, um, that are reporting in uh, with COVID cases. Um, there's a big, uh, still probably about, um, uh, 80%, and I can get you the, the exact numbers, 80 to 85% are from sort of the top 10 to 11, 12 countries. Um, and 
So you have big parts of the world that where this has not hit yet, if that seems possible, given how long we've been talking about it. Um, but uh, so for WHO, that is really the big worry. Um, the, the shape of the curve, though, if you look across the world, is very, very similar. Um, and you know, we just got off the call with Imperial College, uh, who came out uh, yesterday. And if folks haven't seen it, it's, um, I think it's a useful paper. Uh, and they also have the model that was behind it um, that looked at the potential impact uh, if nothing's done over the next uh, uh, months by countries, which of course is not the case. Basically, every country in the world is doing something. Um, and then uh, what would be, uh, you know, how many lives could we save if we if we move quickly and, and uh, move robustly. So um, I guess the, we also had a review uh, yesterday, which if I'm able to um, get the revised slides, I'd be very happy to share through the Patient Safety Movement Foundation of that maps out the measures that countries are taking. And a lot of times we term these non-pharmaceutical interventions everything from you know, asking for, for uh, now WHO is terming this physical distancing, uh, the term social distancing anyway has, um, has evolved unfortunately to have some negative con uh, connotations for uh, people with uh, COVID when there's many of us in the world, um, many of them in the world, uh, and the, um, uh, to uh, travel and trade restrictions and border controls, et cetera. Um, Basically, uh, if you wanted to get um, on a plane and go somewhere right now, the only place with a couple exceptions, you could go to Greenland, for instance, that is still open in case you're looking for a summer destination that's not closed yet. But um, basically almost everywhere else has travel uh, restrictions. When you look at the impact of those travel restrictions, you know, anyway, this is not an exact science, but um, they, they are having some impact if, if they're done early in, in you know, WHO char characterizes the disease um, in terms of the four C's of um, uh, sort of isolated cases, uh, uh, sporadic cases, clusters, and then community spread. And if you are in, early in those, um, that evolution institute uh, travel restrictions, it can delay by a, a couple weeks, sometimes a wider community spread. But um, usually, if it's done later, as, as happened in Europe, it has very little, uh, it has very little uh, immediate effect in terms of the, the shape of the curve. Um, we get uh, there anyway. This database looks at other measures that are that are there. Um, clearly, uh, asking people to try and uh, stay home um, is one of the number one uh, uh, efforts. We have put out a lot of guidance um, recently about and when working with countries about the potential impact of that on societies, on businesses, and then also on, um, on uh, the control of the disease and, and also potentially on regular service delivery. And obviously you need to keep those regular services open and figure out a way to do it in a safe way. And that's um, one of the, gonna be one of the priorities, certainly in New York, Washington, uh, California, uh, these days, um, and uh, you know that that's a big uh, priority as the as the caseload mounts. Um, and you know, if you look at the the, the Chinese experience, we're doing um, a several webinars with our China office, and I'm uh, offering some. And if we wanted to show a few of those experiences uh, um, in more specificity next week, I'd be very happy to come back and talk a bit more about it. But they are uh, many countries, China included, are preparing for not just the first wave, the first big first wave of these uh, cases, but a potential rebound. China did a very good job, um, uh, really, uh, they moved probably, and by their own admission, too slow in Wuhan and Hubei province, um, and had a big explosion there, but, once, but they were able to clamp down nationwide, and that meant that m many other provinces had, had quite low uh, infection rates relative to Hubei and Wuhan, which then allowed for massive redeployment of health workers, of bed capacity, respirators, and other supplies, PPE, to Wuhan, so that they were able to surge and really deal with it. One of the chief worries, personally, that I have, this is not any um, stance of WHO, is that a number of countries, the US included, has adopted a, um, a more, you know, in line with its health system, more federal approach in letting the states 
uh, having things go state by state, which gives you very limited capacity for big redeployments. Um, if you, right now, if we were facing, if these were wildfires in New York City and California and other parts of the country, we would be sending fire crews from Colorado, from Idaho, but um, it's healthcare, so we don't do that. So we, I think we really have to think differently uh, about this. So um, that uh, work was effective in China. They are preparing though for a potential rebound because in those areas where they had low infection rates, they're, they're susceptible to this. So now they have only imported cases um, now in China and uh, they have said, look, between now and then when, when the, the second wave comes, a rebound comes, whether it's part of the um, colder weather next year or it's, uh, it's even later uh, this year in the summer, depending on what we learn about the virus's evolution, you will need again to flatten the curve wherever it comes. Um, and then you also, in the intervening time, need to raise capacity uh, both for hospitals, but also um, earlier on in testing capacity and in uh, your primary care um, system to, to help manage the vast majority of cases, which are gonna be mild cases and do so in a, in a safe way that um, keeps, vulnerable patients, uh, keeps vulnerable patients safe. So I think some of those things are really gonna be important. And then making some of the detailed decisions about how you know, your hospital and your hospital colleagues are going to um, manage the discharge of patients. What, what is the guidance and how, how can you move people out um, based on care requirements and then based on uh, how long the, you know, you have um, viral shedding, which is an evolving picture at, at the moment. And I think that's something that would be very good for us to come back and look at. And the last bit that I, it's kind of a bit of an open call that we can take up later, but one of the things that is we are really wrestling with in many parts of the world is around healthcare worker infections. In Italy, we have 9% of the infections are healthcare workers, and that's, um, yeah, for, uh, for it's, a, it's a high rate, and, uh, and there's a lot of worry about um, within the professional communities. Um, it's a big worry in Italy where they've called back retired uh, physicians. Uh, I just saw a super touching tweet about um, uh, one of the physicians who did uh, one of the first open heart transplants um, in Italy coming out of retirement. Uh, he's uh, in his late 70s to, um, to treat patients. And, you know, it's uh, you're really putting him in harm's way, but there's no other choice. So I think um, uh, that right now we have um, everyone's focused on the mask, um, on the surgical N95 uh, mask. And, you know, as those of you who are listening know about infection prevention and control, the vast, vast, vast majority of, of infections in any type of setting, whether it be routine um, nosocomial infections, quote unquote, or in Ebola settings, is about how you set up and manage your, your patient flow and your service delivery. It's not about which PPE you wear, which a piece of PPE you wear, it's how you use it and how you set up your patient flow. And so. Uh, we are looking um, right now to look with partners who might be um, uh, tracking healthcare worker infections and the causes to, to help uh, contribute to global knowledge database on this so we can start to share some of that learning very quickly for, for folks um, and try to get off this debate about which masks to wear. So anyway, I could go on for a long time, but those are just some of the pressing issues that are keeping me up during the few hours that I'm sleeping uh, these days. And it's really a pleasure to be here. So back over to you. Well, thank you, Ed. That was very, very helpful. We actually just got a, a question that I wonder if you can answer for us. You know, there's a lot of a lot of research is being done right now. There's a lot of papers being shared. We obviously haven't had time for peer review of, of these. Um, any any recommendations for clinicians out there that are reading some of these papers? What what is what are some of the things that that they need to keep in mind so that they can rely on that data? Hmm. Yeah, that is a great uh, point. Um, maybe afterwards, uh, I mean, I don't have an easy answer for that, so I'll just say that right up front. Um, you know, like for instance, just this Imperial College paper that came out um, estimating the, the, um, what's the potential impact that was also not peer reviewed because people are just trying to get information out as quickly as possible. Um, and even some of the peer reviewed stuff that I've seen, uh, sort of review on healthcare worker infections done in China. I, anyway, I personally, it, there were some quality issues there. So, so these days it really depends because everyone's trying to rush stuff through. 
Um, first off, WHO does, from our side anyway, um, WHO does have a clinical management uh, um, network that it runs and does a weekly call. And we try to run through our, the, the lead on that um, is a fantastic colleague of mine, Janet Diaz. And we'd be very happy to share the, um, the how to get linked into that for any of your uh, clinical teams who want to have someone on the calls to hear the sort of latest about what's being talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there are a few other resources that we could point to that are trying to pull together some of the, you know, in a more, a slightly more curated way, some of the information uh, out there. But I think it's, a, I think it's actually a gap. And, and um, so I'd be very interested if any of the people on, online have, um, have some potential solutions on that. Uh, but the Lancet has uh, itself put together sort of a, a review of some of these, which is really quite good. And there's a couple others. So maybe um, after the call, uh, we could uh, pull a few of those together, as well as the, the connection to our clinical management uh, network. And that, that could be at least a first step. That would be fabulous. Thank you, Ed. I, I think this is Robin, too. It's important to note that um, while uh, we do know the, the coronavirus is part of a a family of coronaviruses. There's been other coronaviruses as well. And so um, uh, right now, uh, what we know is that it is spread by droplet. It can be aerosolized. And so like when you give a, a, a nebulized treatment, uh, when you're intubating a patient and uh, bagging them. So that's when you need um, an N95. So there are circumstances and situations where you can aerosolize the, uh, uh, the, the virus, but it is spread by, by droplets. So uh, you do need a, a mask, uh, you know, like wear a surgical mask or a, a, a medical mask for your PPE. And then uh, you, as the CDC and World Health Organization support, you use an N95 or what we call an enhanced uh, uh, PPE, um, uh, when you're in situations where you're providing treatments that aerosolize uh, the virus. So with Corona, you do need N95s, but it's circumstantial. Great. Well, that's excellent. Because Donna, if I could, Donna, yes, can, may I just say one, one thing on this point? I think, I think it's, uh, it's obviously essential that we, we manage the impact of our PPE in our, for our healthcare workers. I think the other element we need to really concentrate on as well is, is, uh, is the, the impact on, their, on themselves, the, the, the clinical burnouts that, that we need to prevent uh, and the support we need to give them and their families uh, so that they are able to concentrate on their work and not worry about uh, other aspects of, of, of life at the moment. And I think that's another key issue for us uh, uh, as we move forward. Yeah, great point. Well, Robin, um, you know, you mentioned using volunteers to um, to support your staffing. Any ideas on where volunteers are needed the most and where folks can get those volunteers from? Mm, that's that's a, a great question. I'm kind of having a hard time thinking off the uh, the top of my head. Um, so I think I need to think about that. We've been using them more in administrative work, um, uh, managing some of the supply chain background work um, that happens on the back, you know, in, but kind of behind the scenes, but not uh, necessarily public facing. Um, so I, I probably need to get more information about other uses and bring it forward because I think there's other creative ideas and I'm just not coming to my head. So, so Donna, in, um, in the UK, you might have seen uh, earlier this week, we launched a, a national program for, to, uh, uh, for volunteering uh, to support the, the health system in, in non-clinical areas. And uh, within three days, we've uh, had 600,000 uh, sign up uh, to this volu volunteering process. Uh, and, and, those, and people will be using all walks of, all walks of life <laughs> Uh, to help and support the, the, the vulnerable uh, in doing basic elements of care, uh, but also shopping, also uh, helping support pharmacists, helping support all the, the non-clinical activities that, that require uh, manpower. So it's, a, it's an incredible uh, 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 opportunity, uh, but, uh, but also an incredible response 
uh, from across the country. And I'm sure this, this will be mirrored, uh, is being mirrored in many other countries around the world. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I, I, yeah, I thought about pharmacists like dropping off meds because we're trying to keep people from coming into our pharmacies. You have courier services, supply chain support. Uh, there's just a lot of process management right now. Just, just, tra just traffic really around. And, and even uh, we're doing a lot more phone uh, screening and uh, kind of wayfinding by phone is sometimes uh, helpful as well. So yeah, we'll, we'll be learning from each other. Well, and we also had a comment from Nancy Connolly to, um, to our panel re recommending that we look at state and county medical reserve corps as another source of volunteers. That's wow. an excellent idea because as she, she comments that they've already been background checked and vetted. So that's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a question. I'm not sure if anybody knows the answer to this, um, but is there any update since last week on any new clinical trials or new therapies that you've heard of? I know there's again, been a lot of conversation, um, but, uh, but Ed, anything in particular that you've heard in the last week that we, you think would be helpful to share? Yeah, we just um, started, and I can also send this to you. I mean, anyway, uh, there, there are a couple out there, but I'll just speak of one. The um, uh, WHO Solidarity uh, uh, trial that's looking at um, the sort of four of the most prominent um, uh, therapeutics uh, that are out there and, and tracking um, patients uh, for it. So that's one. I won't take too much time going into it, but um, that uh, is, I think, is very is going to be very interesting, uh, and um, we hope to uh, have uh, some results and not not so so long. But it, where, um, the the DG had uh, launched the the this um, on Wednesday, and uh, the work that we're going to be um, uh, moving on it. Uh, they've had a bunch of countries that are already um, uh, signed up to it. So that's. Um, that'll be an important one for us. Great, great. Another question that we have um, is about uh, another COVID pandemic. Um, is it possible that we'll have additional uh, epidemics and pandemics coming back around and outside of vaccinations, is there anything that we can do about it? Yeah, shall I comment on that? But probably lots of folks on your panel would be very good. Um, the uh, is um, uh, just to reiterate what I said that a bunch of countries that are farther along, um, China, North Korea, Singapore, uh, and then um, spots Singapore, Hong Kong, et cetera, are planning for uh, potential quote unquote rebounds, the second wave of this. Um, and uh, but mo most of the modeling that's out there is looking at sort of, you know, um, what we, we need to get to herd immunity. And that was some of the analysis, um, I mean, maybe Mike can speak to this too, that was done for the UK um, in terms of uh, measures that are needed um, and balancing sort of the non-pharmaceutical interventions with, uh, with the herd immunity that would result from the 80% mild and moderate cases that are, um, that are uh, coming around. So um, I, again, um, the whole point of the novel aspect of this virus is that people, you know, no one can say with any predict uh, predictability, but I think it, um, most of the discussions that we are in, although it's all, you know, so focused on the response right now, does um, assume that there's going to be some, um, some potential second wave, even if you're looking at a global, if you're looking at the sort of global wave of this moving through different parts of the world. Great. Well, we also received a note from Steve Barker um, to update us from the American Society of Anesthesiologists webinar last night. He says that they now recommend N95 masks for all intubations and airway procedures and not just those on suspected infected patients. So I imagine we'll, we'll continue to see stricter guidelines uh, as, we, as we move through, right? Robin, any thoughts on that? No, I think we'll just kind of wait and see as they, they publish. Um, I don't think it would be a bad idea. <laughs> so um, I think it's good. Excellent. 
Well, it doesn't appear that we have any other questions at the moment, so that is very exciting. Um, I would like to share, I'm very excited to let everybody know that we're hoping to be able to move more towards a uh, on-demand type education format. So rather than waiting until Friday every week, we're going to be doing some, uh, some Zoom interviews and providing them to you on demand. So Ed, I hope that um, I can take you up on your offer and speak with you next week in some more detail about, uh, about the links that you were speaking about. Yeah, I'd be, ha be, um, be happy to. Uh, and uh, we can, um, I don't know, anyway, we can talk about the logistics uh, offline. Um, and some of these uh, are um, from our uh, China office, but we've also got new um, learnings coming in from other countries too. Great. Well, then we we are are going to be just like uh, just like the front line that's out there, and we're asking them to do just in time training and be very very nimble. We're going to do the same thing here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Well, thank you to our panelists. I appreciate your your time, um, and uh, thank you to everybody who joined us today and for all of our great questions. We will continue to solicit your feedback uh, regarding what it is that you want to know about coronavirus, and then we will do our best to bring that information to you in a very timely manner. Thank you. Thank you all. I just mentioned really quickly, I just uh, put up the, and you can share it afterwards, the link um, that's to the R&D section of the WTO website. So there's a, there's a lot of information there on the different research, uh, research and development work that's going on. So not just on the therapeutics, but on the vaccines and also on diagnostics. Um, there's a lot uh, that would be very interesting to folks. Great. Well, we will be sure to post that on our resources website at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, then we, we did extend the time frame to 915 because we thought we might go over, but it looks like we got done just in time. So this is very exciting. And uh, I hope that everybody enjoys your Friday and your weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank guys. you, Donna. Thank you, and thank you, Ed, and yeah. thanks, Robin. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone.